So I'd like to welcome you all to our interactive Healthy Minds, Healthy Climate webinar. And my name is Sahela, and I'll be your host for this event. So some of you may have attended the expert panel um, that the Climate and Health Alliance um, and partners hosted in early October. And if not, uh, we're providing a link in the chat to the recording. So this is uh, the second part of this mental health project funded by the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. And another component of the project is a compilation of mental health resources on the Kaha website. So we're also providing a link to that in the chat. And I would just like to let you know that this event is being recorded. So uh, first of all, I would like to recognize uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work and acknowledge that sovereignty of the land we call Australia has never been ceded. Uh, we commit to listening to and learning from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and organizations about how we can better reflect Indigenous ways of being and knowing in our work. So I would like to acknowledge the Yagara and Turbal peoples as the traditional custodians of the land I'm dialing in from. Um, I'm currently in Mianjin or Brisbane. So before I provide an overview of our session um, this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, I'll just quickly introduce myself. So I'm a PhD student at the University of Queensland School of Public Health. And I'm also a research officer at the Queensland Centre for Mental Health Research, where I work with Associate Professor Fiona Charlton, who incidentally was on the expert panel that I just mentioned. Um, I'm currently undertaking a placement at CAHA, working with the project's manager, Millie Burgess, where I have been involved in the development of this webinar. Uh, so today we're going to start off with an interactive activity where You'll be provided um, the space to express and explore feelings in small groups in breakout rooms um, in response to two questions. So further details will be provided on this. Um, then we'll be learning about a model to help people cope with climate change related distress, which looks at three types of coping, emotion focused, problem focused and meaning focused. This will be followed by a segment on burnout, including another interactive activity. We'll then be hearing about a case study from Tipping Point of how they're working towards incorporating anti-oppression, justice and inclusion and healthy work principles in their team to help cultivate a group culture that is reflective of community care and accountability. And our final presentation will be on the benefits of nature for mental health and well-being. Um, finally, if we have time, we'll open the floor for audience questions, which you can enter into the chat as they arise. And one of the team will have them ready for this part of the agenda. And we hope that you'll be able to take away ways to foster resilience and cultivate hope. Um, and stay engaged with the challenges of climate change and keep working towards a better future. So before we begin, I'd like to quickly go over some housekeeping. So I'd encourage you all to update your Zoom name if you haven't already, um, to include your name, uh, preferred pr pronouns, if that's something you're comfortable with, and the country that you're on. And please also feel free to introduce yourself in the chat with a bit more about yourself. And as I said, you can use the chat throughout the event to ask questions, which we will collate. And we'd like to really encourage people to participate during the interactive components to get the most out of this webinar and um, keep your cameras on. Uh, and while speakers are presenting, please keep your microphones muted. And also note that most of the event, aside from the breakout room discussions will be recorded and made available after the event. Finally, and importantly, a note on self-care and creating a safe and supportive environment. Our focus here is on mental health and well-being. So if you do need to take a, a pause or a break, um, please feel free to do so. And we'll also be providing referral information now and over the course of the evening. 
So, and now I'd like to introduce the facilitator of our first activity, Dr. Sally Gillespie. She has worked as a Jungian psychotherapist for over 20 years before undertaking doctoral research on the psychological experience of ongoing climate engagement. She lectures and facilitates workshops on climate psychology and eco-psychology, and is the author of Climate Crisis and Consciousness, Reimagining Our World and Ourselves. Sally is an active member of Psychology for a Safe Climate and the Climate Psychology Alliance. Uh, so over to you, Sally. Thank you very much, Sahela, and, and welcome everyone. Um, so we're going to start off with getting, giving you the chance to talk to one another in breakout rooms, to check in with yourself and with one another post COP which as we know has been a very mixed experience and there's I'm sure a lot of mixed and fluctuating and complex emotions following this whole ro roller coaster uh, event and the build up to it. And we're setting up breakout rooms because uh, in my work, particularly with psychology for safe climate, we get such consistent feedback about how valuable it is to sit and talk with one another um, and to really be able to tune in both to yourself and to others through, through reflective conversation and deep listening. And we really are very committed to seeing this as a way to increase peer support uh, uh, in uh, increasing psychological and organizational resilience. So you're going to have 15 minutes in the breakout room and we're going to give you a couple of questions to respond to. And what I want to emphasize here is that it's really important to listen and to speak to one another safely. And by this, I mean making a commitment to confidentiality. This means that it's while it's fine to talk about your own experience uh, when you come out of the room, uh, breakout room, it's not, it's not a right to speak about others' experience. So everything that is shared in the room in that sense is confidential that what you can bring out is your own experience that you had in there in terms of what you hear yourself saying and what it's like to really sit and listen to one another. Deep listening means listening without interruption. We're not here to critique or to problem solve. So when each person has their chance to speak, to respond to their question, just, just sit and listen. And if you, the speaker, get to a point where there's silence, Go with that silence because that silence can often be allow you to again listen in just a little bit deeper or feel something perhaps new or different. Uh, and to sit together to really reflect and digest together is very valuable. So we're going to put two questions. I think Millie's going to put them up in the chat, uh, which I'll say in a minute. And there's going to be three people in the breakout room. And this means that you're each going to have two minutes to respond to each of the questions. So you'll do one question first. Uh, the first question, how are you feeling post-COP? One person speaks for two minutes while the others listen, then the next, and then the next. And you might want to appoint a timekeeper for each speaker who after two minutes can just wiggle the fingers to say, your time's up, time to switch to the next person. So after you have done that, uh, round that six minutes altogether in your group of three, you'll then go into the next question, which is in relation to your climate work, what challenges you and what sustains you right now. Now, when you get into your breakout rooms, give yourself a, a minute each to introduce yourselves, um, to say who you are, where you're from, uh, perhaps a bit about what your, describe your, your role in terms of climate work. Uh, uh, and um, maybe even sit together and take a deep breath before inviting the first speaker to, to speak. Uh, now, how are we going in terms of um, getting the breakout room sorted? We're looking okay. Um, I just might need one more minute if that's okay. That's fine. And please put into a chat if you've got a question. Uh, hopefully, from what I've said, it's fairly clear what, what um, you're to do there. As I said, really focus on making the place welcoming and safe to speak to each other about experience we're all sharing uh, in, in terms of staying engaged in this work. Sally, would you like to get us started with this? Yes, we've got everyone back, have we? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. 
Welcome back. Uh, we're, we're keen to hear how this experience was for you um, and kind of get us a, a bit of a general sense for the whole group about where you are in relation to these questions. So because it's a large number, rather than trying to, to do a, 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 an on-screen harvest, we're going to use the Padlet um, tool, which uh, some of you might be familiar with. Um, it's a bit new to me, but let's see how we go. So you've been given the link, is that right, uh, Millie? Yes, so Millie's just put the link in the chat. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, you'll see these questions and you'll just be able to add the, your responses as comments below each question and they will be entirely anonymous as well. So we might actually work through the questions, uh, each question first. Um, so first of all, if you can just put in some of the feelings, how are you feeling post-COP? Uh, yeah, we're getting embarrassed here. Um, please, yeah, still determined, flat but not surprised, detached, surreal, disappointed. Yes, do feel free to use chat if that's easier for you. Weary, discouraged, disappointed and frustrated not surprised, angry, depressed, deflated, worried, fearful, bamboozled, angry and frustrated. No different to any other time. Resigned, mostly very disappointed, unsure. Great to see China finally sign up. If anything, COP26 was more successful than I expected. Um, Still determined, appalled, but not surprised, angry and disappointed. Hopeless, worried, business as usual, much work to do, disappointed, still hopeful for the next, next meeting in 12 months. Interesting mix of cranky and hopeful, more determined. Okay, so we've really got a huge range of, of feelings here, uh, but we're seeing a few things pop up a number of times, angry, determined, frustrated, um, some a little bit better than they expected, some uh, a bit more disappointed. Somewhat heartened, yeah. So, this range of feelings, and you know, if we'd asked you tomorrow, there might be a, a, there would be perhaps some, a few other things coming in too. Is is really to be expected uh, following uh, this event? And I, I'm aware that for many of you, that's not only the event of COP, but it was the whole lead up. You know, months, if not years, of lead up to to the whole experience and your contributions there. Um, and we're finishing a little bit there on somewhat heart and many of the NG folks who participated are telling us there were positive outcomes. So a mixture of how we feel about the outcomes, how it was to sit through the process and so on. So going on to the next question, in relation to your climate work, what challenges you and what sustains you right now? The solar punk movement gives me hope for the future I want to see, a real utopia. Nature sustains me. Yeah. So can we move, just move down? Um, incredible Mo movement sustains me and growing recognition of climate health links. I love that there are so many passionate people trying to do their bit and staying positive despite the disappointment of COP. Challenge, self-doubt, daunted. How do I add to the screen? Challenges this year. Use chat if you're having trouble with the screen. Energy of others. Sustaining there. Challenges, editing. Our public, have we got, can we scroll down on the Padlet a bit more? Many organizations still committed to reduce emotions as hopeful, challenge facing the reality sustained by like-minded, wonderful people. Okay, so please scroll down. Hopefully this will all be available for people after because there's really such a richness here. Um, I'd just like to end with looking at how did you find this experience? 
Does anything surprise you? Something you can take from it? Uh, can we scroll down a little bit more there? Yeah, cathartic, encouraging, nice to chat with allies. Good to see how everyone normalizing the feelings. Yeah, good to reflect on things. Wanting and needing to connect more with people I've seen there to address kind of good, refreshing, relief, positive and supportive. Ah, good. So one of the things we, which we, we felt was so important to give this time over is to, to really reinforce the, our need to talk to one another. We can sometimes get very focused on the tasks, the, the work at times seems, seems so much. Um, but even that was just 15 minutes of three people sitting down and, and finding that little sustenance and support. Perhaps it could be an hour or so with colleagues. You know, uh, we're going to talk a lot about uh, addressing burnout organisationally and perhaps think about ways this can be brought into your group and organisation. A listening circle, a sharing circle, or, or, or just a good check-in at the beginning. Um, so I think it's time to move, to move on now. Um, and I'll be rejoining you later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sally, for facilitating that activity. I know I found it really useful. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Susie Burke. Uh, she's an environmental psychologist, therapist, climate activist, and parent living in central Victoria. Her key interest is in the role that psychology plays in helping us understand the causes, impacts, and solutions to climate change. For 17 years, as senior psychologist at the Australian Psychological Society, she developed resources on coping with, uh, coping with climate change, raising children for a climate altered world and disaster preparedness and recovery. She now works in private practice, consulting to organizations and running workshops and individual sessions to help people come to terms with climate change. And she's also an adjunct uh, associate professor at the University of Queensland. So over to you now, Susie. Thank you very much, Sue Haler, and thank you very much for organising this and then inviting me to this session. It's lovely to see all these faces, some familiar faces and people that I don't know. And Sally, thank you for the, that beginning and getting us to connect with people and talk about how we've been feeling and what we've been thinking. Um, that's sort of a good segue into what I was going to spend some time on as well. So um, what I'm going to talk about is a model that I use. I use this both with clients and in the academic writing that I do with other psychologists on talking about climate change, uh, both with children and with adults. And it's a model um, uh, that was originally known as the transactional stress and coping model, which was developed by Folkman Lazarus in the 80s. And I remember all those many years ago when I was writing my PhD on looking at women with breast cancer, I was looking at the stress and coping model and lo and behold, it's turned up again uh, with researchers and psychologists who are working with people dealing with the existential stress of climate change. So more recently, an environmental psychologist in Sweden called Maria Ojala has been using, uh, has been looking at how young people, children and young people cope with climate change. And she found that the things that they were doing fitted beautifully onto this transactional stress and coping model that looks at these three um, these three types of strategies that uh, that people use. So that's what I'm going to just go through briefly today. So I'm talking about coping with the existential distress of climate change or coping with climate change, but it's worth taking a moment just to think about what does coping actually mean. So coping is not just about how we manage uncomfortable or distressing feelings, which is often what we initially think coping is about. Coping is also about how we think, and it's also about how we respond to the thing that we're upset about. So the things that we do, um, you know, with our legs and our arms and our, and our mouths. So it's about feeling and it's about thinking and it's about doing. So this um, model that we use looks at these three types of coping strategies, they being emotion-focused coping strategies, 
uh, problem-focused coping and meaning-focused coping strategies. So I'm going to go through each of them in turn. So what Sally was getting us to do before when we were talking about how we were feeling about COP uh, is an example of um, emotion-focused coping strategies where what we're doing is we're um, con connecting and talking and sharing and talking about our feelings uh, expressing our feelings as a way of being able to manage the distressing emotion. So emotion-focused coping is about the things that we do to manage the uncomfortable feelings. And there's a whole host of things that, that we can do and do do. So, for example, one of the best ways in which you can manage an uncomfortable feeling is to move your body, to get active, to go for a walk, to go for a run, to shoot hoops, to, you know, to, 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 um, raise your heartbeat, to take off a layer of clothes, to get sweaty. Um, and that's one way in which people can deal with uncomfortable feelings. But another one, of course, is to actually allow yourself to feel the feeling. And this will probably come up with a few different people uh, speaking tonight. But the thing is that the distressing and painful, uncomfortable feelings that we have about climate change are there for a reason. They're actually, it's actually a healthy and human response to be feeling that way that we do feel to a dangerous and very dysfunctional situation that we're facing in the world. And when we feel things deeply, it actually motivates us to then respond. And responding is, you know, one of the ways in which we take action to, to get out of this terrible mess. So noticing our feelings and allowing them and giving them space and allowing them to have their beginning and then their middle and their and then their end are all really important parts of um, being able to stay engaged with the problem of climate change. Because if we don't allow ourselves to feel the feelings, we, um, we risk... Um, coming up with a whole lot of maladaptive coping strategies as a way of pushing away the feelings, which often involve switching off and not paying attention to the problem of climate change or distracting ourselves endlessly with what's the latest thing on Netflix. And all of these are also useful emotion-focused strategies, but, um, but, the, but they have their place. So one of the things that Maria Ojala found when she was doing her research with young people was that one of the preferred emotion-focused coping strategies that young people use was distraction um, or minimizing the problem. So getting themselves distracted with other things. And that is a fine strategy, but not if that's the only strategy that you're using. So we have to have a balance of, you know, at times being able to allow ourselves to feel these deep feelings. Um, so another one, of course, is being able to spend time with caring people and in a way that that was what I uh, noticed somebody said in the comments before that actually they were surprised that they that talking to someone that they didn't even know and they never met before about how they were feeling about COP was actually strangely reassuring and comforting. So there's both um, spending time with strange uh, caring people who we haven't met yet, but also spending time with people who love and care about us, um, or, or spending time with like-minded people who are working on similar strategies or, or you know, or, or care about similar things. Um, and then another part of the things that we might do that is an emotion-focused coping strategy that also involves other people is doing very simple things like having hugs with other people. And I remember reading some interesting research during some of the COVID lockdowns that was looking at um, uh, the the absence of hugs and physical contact. And this was again, looking at young people. And of course the young teenagers who were locked down and who weren't you know, getting put in a headlock and having hugs with their friends at school anymore. Um, and what impact that that was having on levels of loneliness and distress and isolation. And what they were finding was that, well, what they were reporting on in this, in this um, research paper was how we have a whole lot of these nerve endings, these C tactile afferents in the back of our neck and the shoulders, just where you get a, you know, you get your friends in a hug or, you know, where you pat somebody on the back. And when we when we have contact there or when we're hugging somebody or when we're being stroked at the back of our neck, it releases, um, it releases endorphins and it lowers the cortisol and it's a terrific way of being able to manage uncomfortable feelings. So, you know, as well as talking with people, having physical contact with people and, um, you know, being able to embrace our friends and have hugs is also an important one of these emotion focused coping strategies. Um, another one is of course spending time in nature which Tristan is going to talk to us about later. Switching off, taking a break, downing your tools, that's like you know the distraction, distracting yourself from, from the problem. And um, Oh, and breathing, using the breath. So breathing out, I spend a lot of time in my practice and any of you in here who, are, who work with clients will also probably spend a lot of time teaching people breathing strategies. So being able to breathe out, relax the diaphragm, 
um, and to activate a, a feeling of safety and connection and relaxation and well-being. So that's a host of different techniques that we use that all come under emotion-focused coping, the things that we do to, um, to deal with the distressing feelings. So the next one I'm going to talk about is the problem-focused coping strategy. So these are the things that we do to deal with the problem that is actually causing the stress, which in this case is anthropogenic climate change. So that's anything that we do that mitigates climate change, so anything that's about sequestering carbon in the ground or reducing our carbon emissions. Plus, it can also be adaptation behaviours, but I'm still mainly interested in talking about mitigation behaviours, given that we have this narrowing window of opportunity to, uh, you know, utterly move ourselves away from a fossil fuel based economy. So when we talk about problem focused coping strategies, these being the things that we do with our legs and our arms and our mouths, when we talk to politicians, when we get out and we protest, when we, you know, dig holes and plant trees and all those sorts of things, we, it's important to think about the difference between individual level behaviours and group level behaviours or collective behaviours or system, system level behaviours, because whilst both are important. Um, they're the, we always try to push people towards considering the value of the group um, or um, collective behaviour uh, or collective problem focused um, behaviours rather than the individual level behaviours. Because one of the things that we know is that if people are just focusing at an individual level, there's a risk then that a, it becomes a bit tokenistic. We can only think of so many things to do each day that are for saving the planet. And if what we've done is switched off all the lights as we left home and thought, oh, that's it, I'm off the hook now, I've done my bit for the planet, and all we did was actually turn our lights off, that's actually not really going to solve climate change. Whereas when we engage in collective behaviours with other people, we maximise our, our impact. Um, and, you know, we don't have time to just be all engaging in individual level behaviours. And I read one writer the other day who said that anyhow, a complete narcissistic focus on the self, i.e. just focusing on individual things that you can do in your own life, is actually not healthy. So I, I quite liked the idea that, uh, that that was another reason to, you know, move ourselves away from just doing the individual level household behaviours, even though they assuage our guilt and make us feel better, being problem focused coping strategies, Actually, as a climate activist, I'm always trying to encourage people to engage in those group level behaviours. And the other thing that we know as well is that if people do just involve in individual level behaviours, there's a risk that they end up feeling helpless and hopeless um, and miserable anyhow, because, of course, they know that that's not a way in which they can ever fully solve the problem of climate change. So that's problem focus, things that you do. And then the third one is meaning focused coping strategies. And so there's a range of different behaviors we do when we're engaging in meaning focused coping strategies. And these are the things that we do when we change the meaning of climate change or we use our thinking and think about it differently in order to feel um, uh, less despairing, less helpless and hopeless and, and, and maybe a bit hopeful. So this is where um, the strategies of active hope come in. So. Um, I'll come back to that in a tick. But what um, Maria Ajala in her research with the young people in Sweden was finding that they were doing as a meaning focused coping strategy was noticing other people that were um, engaging in the problem. This came up a lot in um, the feedback that you were giving before as well, that it actually helps us when we notice how many different actors um, there are all over the world who are taking action on urgently on the problem of climate change. And that helps us feel a sense of solidarity and, and, um, and hopefulness and you know, keeps us engaged. Um, the other one is to be looking at historical examples. So looking into the past and noticing how wicked problems or enormous problems in the past have been, have been solved by the concerted efforts of people like you and I who have just worked week after week, year after year um, at the grassroots to, to, to transform society and, and that there have been you know, successes um, in the past and that there will be successes again in the future. So that's another one. Uh, the other one is another one is to be thinking about the positive actions or the positive um, the positives of a zero carbon um, economy or a zero carbon world. So this is a lot of the work that Climate and Health Alliance has done in in the past about talking about the co benefits of taking action on climate change. You know, eating uh, lower on the food chain, eating more of a plant based diet is both good for our health and it's good for the planet. Having more active transport is good for our bodies, it's good for the planet. Uh, those sorts of things. But the last one that I'm going to leave you with um, is uh, the, the importance of being 
being able to use our best thinking in order to come up with creative transformational ideas for how to solve the problem of climate change. And Rob Hopkins, who's the guy who started the Transition Town movement in the UK, has written a lot about this. And one of his recent books is called uh, What If, um, from what, if, what is to what if. So he's starting from, from what is, and he's using his imagination, writing us and looking at examples of people around the world who are using their imaginations to come up with creative, big societal level system, system change, because we can't use the same thinking that got us into this mess, which is sort of capitalistic, you know, using, extracting resources to get us out of this. It just it just won't work. And it, this is a ter terrific opportunity. And so often in the work that um, I do with groups and also with children, um, getting them to be uh, thinking um, in creative ways about um, solutions that can be transformative um, across all levels of society is a place of energy and engagement. And Rob Hopkins says that when we can imagine a different future and then we can tell stories about it, then that activates or it whets our longing and our appetite for it. And then we're much more likely to put our energy and our determination into making it happen. So uh, for those reasons, he really invites people to be continuing to be thinking about and imagining what is the different future that we're wanting to move into so that we can take steps to, to get there. So that's an example of mean focus coping strategy that keeps you in that sort of, okay, I'm still here, I'm still, I'm still working on this problem. Uh, I'm doing this tactic at the moment. So that's a brief summary of those different um, motion focus, problem focus and mean focused coping strategies according to the transactional stress and coping model. Thank you so much for that, Susie. I learned a lot. Um, I really like that research about how does I think that's really nice. Um, <clears throat> so now we'll have Sally back again, who will be talking to us about burnout issues, um, considering the cultural context we live and work within, as well as the typical emotional trajectory of committed climate activists. And we will then be doing another interactive exercise together using Padlet. So over to you again, Sally. Thank you, Sahela. And thank you, Susie. That was really fascinating. And yes, these things do segue into one another, um, as we'll see. So look, I just want to start off. Sorry, is, it, is the sound OK? Yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, when we address issues of self-care and burnout in relation to climate work, we really need to consider the wider context we are embedded within in our society and our workplace, our culture, our home, our family, and of course, our living world. Because it's so important to approach things systemically as Susie was talking about, and not simply seeing how we're doing as a personal issue. In particular, I think it helps to recognize that the dominant mainstream culture we live within is a burnout culture. It uses up resources in an endless drive for productivity and growth, which is all fueled by speed and unrenewable resources. And the roots for this lie in our industrial neoliberal economies and politics, as I'm sure you all well know. And without challenging this expectation and consciousness, it's really easy to re reproduce this in ourselves and our organizations, because it is a mindset we have all been conditioned into through our education system, uh, uh, and other workplaces and families and so on. So it helps to understand that resisting the impulse to pressure ourselves or each other to go faster, go harder, do more, is a culturally subversive move. And it contributes to social cultural change, which is such an important part of our climate work. To, resi to, to resist this does not mean being less effective in our work, but it invites more thoughtfulness and care, which increases the creativity and resilience, which uh, Susie was so much talking about building up through the strategies. So in the work, our workplaces, our teams, our groups, we need to cultivate systemic approaches to support our individual and group resilience and resources. And this need uh, is, I think, very much highlighted by findings of research done by Ro Randall and Paul Hoggett in 2017. And they researched the psychological resilience of climate activists and scientists. 
And they found that activists, the climate activists, worked through a dynamic emotional trajectory resulting from their engagement. And that's been brought up on the screen and I'll, I'll unpack that a bit in a minute. And they learned to find perspective and find, process their emotions and develop strategies for ongoing engagement by developing innovative ways of growing and organizing an emotionally supportive culture as the basis for long-term commitment. Now, this was in quite stark contrast to what they found with climate scientists who are much more isolated and susceptible to burnout or leaving the field altogether. And the problem for them is that they lack support and safe, respectful spaces for working through, acknowledging and working through the ethical and emotional challenges of their work. Also, Randall and Hoggett found that both groups are very susceptible to overwork, something we need to be very well aware of uh, in terms of not going into, into the crisis of burnout more than we need to. So looking at these cycles of stages, you see it up on the screen there. Um, they, uh, they identify these four stages in climate activists in terms of ongoing uh, engagement. And I see this as a cycle. I think we work through the cycle many times. Uh, I know I recognize it in myself. So the first part of it is the epiphany. You wake up, there's a new understanding about the way the world works and your understanding of perhaps what your life is about and its meaning. It can be very energizing, but also shocking if it's coming to terms with climate uh, crisis and emergency. Then we go into the immersion phase where we do a lot of researching and talking and acting. We're really strongly focused on the work, but we're also beginning to realize we have to process the emotions. All those things that came up when we shared them at the beginning through the breakout rooms of depression or anxiety or grief and so on. When we get to the crisis stage, this is where often we've tipped into an intense action and start to become overwhelmed and exhausted and burnout leads to all kinds of feelings of underlying despair or failure or numbness. We can lose our perspective, get lost in the bubble and so on. But perhaps you might want to think what your, your version of burnout crisis is. I know for me, the numbness and the cynicism is a real pointer that I've got to watch out for myself more. The resolution stage is about coming to a more resilient place, moderate action, move out of the bubble, uh, finding a balance between your personal and collective life, uh, and developing some sense of personal agency and your choice. Having a look at that, I wonder where you think you might be, and maybe where your group is. You might want to put that in the chat or just make a note of that. Now, as we learn to recognize the symptoms of burnout and crisis in ourselves and our organizations, quicker, we're also more quickly able to enact strategies to bring ourselves out of that. Now, the next slide uh, gives, again, a, a whole range of things which Randall and Hoggett found very important in terms of uh, developing resilience for activism. Um, accepting and acknowledging necessity and normality of the emotional ebb and flow and cultivating supportive relationships. That's what our breakout rooms were a taste of. Monitoring exposure to media reports is really important. What do you actually need to know? And aligning personal skills and resources and passions to action, getting that right fit for your role. Uh, the next one's very much about what Susie was talking about in terms of inspirational and meaningful narratives. We need that for ourselves and we need that in the group. And we also need to choose projects that are achievable, you know, to, to break them down so we don't feel like we're trying to do the whole thing. Time in the natural world, we'll be talking about self-care regimes we're coming to, uh, time out and focus. So in order to, to bring this down to something very practical, we're now going to, to spend the next 10 minutes or so um, looking at what's called the healthy mind plateau. This was a model developed um, by the neuropsychiatrist Daniel Siegel, as many of you may know his work. And it was a way of summarizing what he says are our seven essential daily mental health activities we need for our emotional and mental well being and for optimal brain function. And he represents it as a platter. And so we've got the share screen up there and you can see the different things. He says they're kind of like vitamins for the brain, these different activities. And it's quite helpful, I think, to have sometimes a schema so you can actually see how you're doing in terms of your day-to-day -day life. And also, I would encourage you to think a little bit about your organisation as we walk through this, because I think 
the activities that are good for you at an individual level are also good to see uh, uh, that variety happening within your organization so that you don't just get stuck in one particular mode or focus. Now, we're inviting you to go to Padlet again. Uh, is that link going up in the chat there? Um, and as we go around the platter, I'm going to ask you to, I'll just explain each, each element. And, and as I do, put in a couple of activities or strategies that you use or that you would really like to use to see that you get a bit of these times in your daily or certainly weekly life. Um, and then have a look what other people are putting up as their strategies, because part of this is sometimes we need a bit of inspiration from one another. Um, so is the Padlet up? Uh, yes, it's being shared. Oh, OK, fantastic. So let's start with focus time. Um, when we, this is when we really closely focus on the tasks we have to do in a goal orientated way. And it strengthens the brain when we can really do that focus. It's, it's good for the brain. But of course, there's lots of times and ways where we're working that we're not really that focused. So the question is here, what helps you focus? Um, one strategy is coming from research basis that we know it takes 43 minutes to have, after 43 minutes, our focus tends to drop off. So one thing is to keep your time at the computer short to that 43 minutes. Now, are people putting in, I can't quite see this, are people putting in their strategies under focus time? Um, so just to explain it, if you click the little um, comments bubble on the focus time segment, you'll be able to add comments, which will then appear. Yeah, so Millie's just highlighting it. So yeah, people have started putting in things. Um, uh, Sally, so there's gardening, reading, um, setting aside time for deep work. Okay, that's great. Um, I just lost. Yep. Okay. So let's see how we're going with time. Okay. Any more going in there? Okay. So we've got what helps with focus. Now, the next one I'm sure many of us struggle with what helps our sleep? When we give the brain time to rest, it does consolidate our learning and it helps us to recover and process the experiences of the day. And of course, you know, there's sleep at night, but there's also power naps. So anything here to help sleep, uh, especially if you've been staying up looking at, at cop news and all that sort of thing, what, what, what helps you go into sleep mode and stay in sleep mode? Um, so I just want to note that you will be able to bookmark this link and return to it, but we'll also save a PDF version and send it out in our email when we send out the recording so you can take more time to look at everyone else's responses. But yeah, we have a couple that have popped up for sleep. Yeah. Um, Could you read them out, Sahela, please? Yeah, so we've got mindfulness and meditation. Someone said naps. Um, someone's an eight hour baby. So this is a non negotiable for them. Schedule, routine, and a lovely environment. Also, music therapy. Music therapy, that's a lovely one. I believe there's some beautiful tapes that uh, you can put on to help you sleep and um, to help sink brain waves. Um, we've also, we've got some more coming in. No coffee after 2 p.m. I'm the same, actually. I'm very sensitive to caffeine. Um, crosswords, routine, nurse screens before bed, <laughs> um, reading, sleep hygiene. Um, someone said lockdown actually helped them with that. And now there's a readjustment phase as we come out of that. Um, reading, reading fiction, yoga. Great. So there's some really great ideas there. And um, it, it helps to really know when you've got a good sleep. I'm in the country at the moment and just being in a dark, quiet place has really improved my sleep beautifully. <laughs> Let's get onto the physical time. What gets you moving? When we move, we nurture our bodies. Um, and it helps the brain to grow. And it also is a really important part, as, as Susie said, of helping us to uh, regulate our emotions and our stress levels. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear, especially what might help you get moving when you're at work. You know, are there ways that you can get up from the screen and, and move? Can you invite others to do that with you when you're at work? And also, what do you do in your daily life outside so of work? 
So we've got running and morning walks, um, yoga and Pilates, aqua aerobics, um, riding a bicycle to and from work, dance, um, walking the jog, having a jog with the man's walks. Yes, but I, I know. Oh, how it all sounds so healthy out there. <laughs> Not a lot of fit people. Um, so a work-related one is a standing desk and walking meetings. Um, that's a great idea. Uh, weekend hikes, um, lunchtime walks, skipping rope. Yeah, that really gets your heart rate, heart rate <laughs> up. Very good if you're getting stressed. Definitely. Uh, using a standing desk, that's great. I've got one at home and that helps a lot. Um, wild swimming. Okay. So we might move on to the next one now. Downtime. How do you veg out? You know, this is a time when we're not focused on anything, no specific goals. We can let our mind wander or daydream, simply relax. All helps the brain to recharge. Might be relaxing, reading, whatever. So, yeah, how do you veg out? Uh, so we've got audiobooks, uh, crime novels, trash reality television, <laughs> <Excellent>. video <laughs> games, uh, movies, books reading ridiculous mindless dreadful tv um, <laughs> yeah. shower, uh, reading and sitting in the garden podcasts music netflix um more video games drawing weeding yeah. watching cooking shows i love to watch cooking shows as well um, so tv and reading is coming up big time i saw something about warm comfort comfort and yeah getting warm yeah um, comfort um drying water of any sort hugs pets definitely pets yeah, uh, board games okay yeah. well we might move on to the next one we've just got a couple more three more to do now next one is a really important one here connecting when we connect with other people or beings don't have to be humans ideally in person or in body activates our brain's relational circuitry and it helps give us more meaning and more generosity in our lives. So how do you connect? Perhaps where do you connect? So we've got dinner parties, feeding and nurturing my friends, um, regular walks with a neighbor, oh, that's a good uh, cafe one. chats, spontaneous video chats, picnics, going to the bay, coffee, um, going to walk in parks, prioritizing social time and housemates, right. neighbors, um, foreign by foreign and lunches, dinner out over the veggie garden fence. Okay, um, so Hela, we might just move on because I'm conscious I'm coming up to my time limit here. I want you to get a chance to do it all. The next yeah. one is time in. How do you tune in? And this is, I think, a, connects to imagination, as Susie was talking about, when we can quietly reflect. Focus on our sensations and images and feelings. It might be through mindfulness or meditation. And this helps create, create increase our coordination and balance in our nervous system. Journaling is a great way to do it. How else might you tune in? Watching, I love that. How I'd seeing a psychologist, indeed. Yeah. Drawing, writing, yeah, so anything where you're just in, internally uh, reflecting and noticing and being being with yourself yeah yeah interesting to think how an organization or your group might tune in fantastic yoga and lots of yoga going on this is fantastic and i just want to leave you with the last one playtime how do you play uh this is you know we need to be spontaneous and creative enjoy new things expand beyond the habitual this all makes new connections in the brain and of course, it's an attitude as much as an activity, but any, any play, pop it in and really have a think too how you can bring play into your group or your workplace or your organisation. Great. So I see lots of things uh, here about creative activities and workshops. Bubbles, that's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> making people laugh, cooking with music and dancing, laughter, Sudoku, having a new puppy really helps. So some lovely ideas there. I hope it started you thinking a little bit about this platter. You might want to spend more, more, more time on um, this, this platter idea and reviewing that. And you might want to share it again with colleagues or with your group too. Just a really good way of keeping that resilience going. 
So I know it's time to hand over now. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing a bit more about, I'd, I'd love to hear about is connecting with nature and how to build up the um, workplace culture. Thank you so much, Sally. That was such a great little exercise and it's so wonderful to get new ideas from people. Um, so yeah, like I said, you should be able to bookmark and return to that link and you know check out all of um, uh, everyone's responses later on. So I uh, just now like to present our next speaker, Kaz Ui. She is a community organizer at Tipping Point, building the leadership capacity and skills of student leaders in the climate strike movement. Previously, she has been an organizer at the Asylum Seeker Resource Center and Oxfam Australia, and a training officer at Democracy in Color, a national racial and economic justice organization led by people of color. She has a background in marine biology and community development, with roots in the Philippines, Kaz is passionate about decolonization and integrating intersectional feminist leadership and community care practices from her home culture in her activist education work. Kaz also loves surfing and currently lives on the unceded lands of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation on the surf coast. So over to you, Kaz. Um, hello, good evening, folks. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm calling you all from the stolen lands of the Wadawara people of the Kulin Nation and that um, sovereignty was never ceded. Um, so next slide, please, like a bit about myself. Um, as um, Suhaila has already mentioned, um, I'm originally from the Philippines and I'm doing um, this work because as someone um, from the islands, um, we're directly impacted by climate change, not just marine ecosystems, but actually the livelihood and food security of my people and loss of culture as well. And um, I just wanted to show that organization as well, the Ocean Action Resource Center, because um, it's where I learned most about the importance of community care and what is possible through collective action as well. Um, and, and also the importance of making sure that um, while we do research on like climate change mitigation and adaptation, we need to make sure that it's accessible to people who need it the most, um, people in the frontline communities. And it's not just like technical jargon as well. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I guess my experiences um, doing that um, marine biology side and the community organizing side as well in the Philippines helped me sort of develop this kind of um, philosophy, if you may, and make this connection with what has already been mentioned with when it comes to self-care. Um, we have this community care aspect as well and that connection um, to nature, um, which I believe um, yeah, Tristan will be speaking about later on. Um, so if you think about it, like self-care, the flip side of that is community care. How do we actually look after each other? Because um, you can't self-care your way out of oppression, for example. Um, and this aspect of community care um, informs how I do my community organizing, especially around how do we help build groups that have healthy, safe, um, effective, and sustainable group culture um, that allows its members like to thrive and to be inspired to be involved as well. Next slide. So um, yeah, I, I included this quote um, because we have this thing about like resilience um, but I feel like it places it all in the individual, like you just need to be resilient. But for my end, especially um, as a person of lived experience, um, just sharing that it can be exhausting, just being resilient. Like, what are we actually doing as a culture to make sure that we're dismantling the systems of oppression that, that yeah, causes people to be marginalized, that causes climate injustice? Next slide, please. Um, so in um, tipping point, uh, I think we skipped the slide. Could we go? Yeah. So in tipping point, um, as we mentioned, we want to model um, within our organization, what does it take to have um, healthy team culture? Um, and so these are just some examples. We won't be able to go into detail about each one of them. Um, I just wanted to focus on the first one, which is won't internalize work stress. When we first developed this, because it's still a work in progress, it originally said won't internalize work, um, but it doesn't recognize that for some people, you can't turn it off um, because of your identity. 
like for example, um, if you're a person of color, you can't turn off um, having doing work in racial justice, for example, because it impacts you directly. So racial justice isn't just like a passion project for me. Um, so it's like saying, as a woman, feminism is a passion project for you, right? So it's not like it's just part of the work that you're already doing. Um, I'd like to focus on the next slide, which is the um, we call them IOG principles. If you go to the next slide, yep. So IOG meaning anti-oppression, justice, and inclusion principles. And it's the we developed this because we wanted to make it like explicit, like in the work we're doing, uh, not only in our team, but in the culture of the community groups we support. So tipping point. Um, supports the School Strike for Climate Network and Stop Adani as well. Um, and like having some principles in place to make it psychologically and culturally safe um, for folks to want to be involved. Because we're always saying that, hey, we need to diversify the movement. But my question is, what are we putting in place, the processes, the, the group culture we have in place to make sure that it's safe for people to be involved to begin with. Otherwise, we're just replicating like the practices and processes that uh, of the systems that we're trying to dismantle supposedly, hey? So we really have to be reflective of that. So um, the first one is looking at how we integrate this work through our roles and work plans. So it's, it's not a side project, it's core to the work that we do. Um, and then we make sure that we approach this work with spaciousness because, you know, topics about um, white supremacy, for example, or race are complex, deeply felt and confronting. And we need to give ourselves and the people we work with in the wider movement space and time to learn and change. And um, and yeah, like while I'm suggesting these things, um, I think a good rule of thumb is doing one intervention thoroughly and thoughtfully will be more impactful rather than like throwing lots of things um, at people all at once. So yeah, baby steps, hey. And um, give people in the grace and opportunity to learn, especially around decolonization and anti-racism because um, shaming and condemning shuts down the space for people to learn, to reflect and grow. And we need to have hard and honest conversations with each other and the movement and make big changes, but we should approach this with grace and give people the opportunity to step into this work. Um, how we define that is we'd rather that people call in rather than call out, meaning directly as well, about, for example, how a certain behavior was in was unacceptable in a group setting. Um, yeah, so um, I know I'm running a bit low in time, so we won't be able to go through the other things. Um, but to wrap it all up, if we go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to highlight this, that there is a difference between diversity and inclusion and liberation and justice. One enjoys the feeling of my presence, the other embraces the fullness of my humanity. And if we want a diverse, powerful movement bringing on like climate justice, we need to focus on liberation and justice. So thank you so much. If you go to the next slide, if you have questions or if you want to connect, um, my um, email is available there. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kaz. That was a really important perspective to provide. And a lot of what you said really resonated with me. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so we'll now um, move on to our final presenter. Um, so that's Tristan Snell, who is an experienced counseling psychologist with practical experience working in private practice, uh, employment services, psychiatric rehabilitation, university counseling, and school settings. His research interests are in counselor education and environmental psychology, particularly the impact of the physical environment on mental health and learning, as well as encouraging sustainable environmental behaviors. So over to you now, Tristan. Well, thank you so much. Um, um, all right, so I've got a few minutes just to talk about the benefits of nature benefits for mental health and well-being. Um, so I'll just start by um, just commenting on um, what the benefits are. Um, I'll, I'll try and comment on some of the theory. So talking about why, why contact and views of nature might be helpful. And then I'll try and draw it together just by reflecting on how this relates to a psychological distress relating to climate change, which is some of the research that I've um, been undertaking with uh, colleagues. Um, so I'm, I'm just 
made some summary points here. And I'll just start by saying as well that the research is really good. It's really clear and it's been going on for many years. So what are the, the, the references that I've just noted here are meta-analyses. So really big studies that collect that hundreds or thousands of studies together. And there's lots of little individual studies that talk about particular benefits for certain groups and, uh, and for certain issues. But broadly speaking, the research over decades is showing that uh, contact with nature, actually spending time in natural environments seems to produce positive affect or, or positive mood, positive changes in how people feel, and it decreases negative affect. Um, and that might seem kind of basic, but it's pretty powerful. Um, that's that sort of finding across hundreds of, hundreds of different studies. Broadly speaking as well, real nature or being in contact with um, real nature is more powerful and effective than virtual or simulated nature, as you might see in say even pictures or videos. But uh, simulated nature does have some benefits as well. Views of nature as well are also really important. Um, and they produce similar effects, though perhaps not quite as powerful as actually spending time in natural environments. And it predicts all sorts of things like life satisfaction and happiness and self-esteem, and also decreases things like depression, anxiety and loneliness. So really important the view out the window in terms of people's well-being. And of course, there's great research on particular interventions as well. So used uh, in, in various therapy settings or horticultural therapy settings, uh, things like gardening and green exercise and nature-based therapy and ecotherapies and these sorts of things that, that tend to be quite effective for improving mental health, um, including for uh, people with various pre-existing conditions. So good research on helping relieve things like depressed mood, reducing anxiety, and of course, increasing uh, positive affect as well. So why does this happen? Um, I'm a little bit technical and mechanical with some of this stuff, but I'll, I'll comment on some of the other things as well. But there's a few different theories, and, and some of the theories that are cited quite commonly um, and fairly dated, but nevertheless are repeated over and over again in the literature and the research. Basically, th this idea that our attention span is limited. Uh, and so after a period of time, uh, we need to do something or visit a particular environment that helps you to recover and restore your attention. And these authors, Stephen and Rachel Kaplan, did some qualitative research back in the 1980s that tended to show that, you know, if you go to visit environments that are uh, allow you to escape, these environments that have more to be seen, that draw your fascinating and they're kind of coherent and pulled together, these environments really help to restore your attention. And it turns out natural environments are pretty ideal. Uh, both spending time and seeing these environments really help you to recover your attention. They also talk about stages of restoration. So spending a little bit of time helps you to clear your head a little bit longer then you start to kind of solve problems that just uh, automatically happens as you spend time. And even this deeper stage where people seem to experience these sort of spiritual experiences even. So these more profound experiences over time as well. Um, stress reduction theory is, is, is a similar idea really, but it's it comes from a more medical sort of background. It, it, it essentially says that these processes happen more unconsciously and views and spending time in nature triggers recovery and relaxation responses, sort of triggers the parasympathetic response. So uh, the authors suggest, uh, Roger Ulrich, is that, that maybe seeing environments that uh, uh, remind one of um, uh, adaptive environments, um, uh, sort of maybe an innate interest in particular settings that would have been adaptive for our ancestors helps to trigger this kind of relaxation response. And it's used consistently, uh, this sort of theory as well, to support all sorts of research for improving uh, medical and other sorts of settings. There's some interesting evolutionary ideas as well. I'll just briefly comment on, so things like the biophilia hypothesis that is often spoken about, this innate this idea that maybe we have this innate tendency to want to connect with nature and other forms of life. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea, I think. However, um, it might be uh, there's more specific particular environments that people are more drawn to and attracted to. So there's also suggestions around habitat selection. Most animals, uh, other living things tend to have particular environments that they, they gravitate towards, not just because of food, but because they have a visual attraction and interest to. 
So some authors have spoken about, well, what's the ideal human environment? You know, we know how to build a, an enclosure for a panda, right? That helps it to survive and uh, procreate, but we don't really know what that is for a human. But the idea perhaps is, it may not be the typical kind of urban environments that many of us live in. There may be a mismatch perhaps between the common urban environments we live in and what people um, might ideally uh, improve their mental health. So there might be a lot of urban, uh, highly built um, environments that are not particularly adapted for our mental health. Other authors will talk, also talk about maybe there's developmental preferences. So children might prefer savannah environments, but this can change over time. Um, and people tend to then just prefer the environments they're exposed to in childhood. So there's a range of different theories. Most of them draw from an evolutionary background. Um, but I'll just mention now as well, just to draw it together, we've done a recent study. Um, this is led by Rebecca uh, uh, Patrick at Deakin. Um, and just a survey of over 5,000 people across Australia. We included questions about eco-anxiety and traumatic stress, but also coping, how people cope with climate change. And uh, we've asked people, you know, what do you do to, to cope with that anxiety and stress? And there's a whole range of things. Some of this is actually drawn from Susie's work. Um, and and uh, we've asked them, well, well it, I guess it turns out one of the things people do the most is seek information about problems and solutions. But just below that, people also visit and view natural environments. So this is what people are doing. Um, and we know that's effective in terms of improving people's mental health. But it's interesting to see this as one of the strategies people use to cope with climate anxiety. Um, so broadly speaking, if I just pull it all together, views and contact with nature impact positively on mental health. That's very clear. Possible reasons for this include things like restoration and relaxation, probably also just relief uh, from the stresses of human built environments. And that contact with nature is a common and probably effective way of coping with climate distress as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tristan. Um, so in the interest of time, we might not go through questions during this um, session, but if you do have any questions, maybe just enter them into chat and we'll try and follow up on them and um, put them in our email tomorrow, which we send out um, with the recording. And uh, just to quickly conclude, I, I really hope you found this webinar useful. And we just have a very short um, poll with um, three questions just for us to be able to evaluate the webinar and the responses will be entirely anonymous. Um, so yeah, we'd really appreciate it if you could fill that out for us. And if you would like to provide more detailed feedback, you can email Millie. Um, so Millie, if you could just get that final slide up. Yeah, so further feedback, uh, feedback can be provided at uh, to that email address that's on the screen now. Um, so just as we're filling out this poll, um, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all our speakers and facilitators for being here tonight. And also like to thank all of you participants for your engagement and like to acknowledge Millie for all her work in organizing the webinar, including uh, being behind the scenes this evening, managing all of our tech, um, and all of the people that we spoke to in our planning and development stage. I've seen a few of you are here tonight, so that's great. And finally, um, a thank you to Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation for supporting this important work. And yeah, as I mentioned, we'll be sending an email tomorrow to all our RSVPs with the recording of the event and links to the um, resources and activities that we did tonight. So yeah, thank you everyone for coming.